my great grandmother when she was born she was born into this relay holding this stick which i call the baton this is the baton of poverty the baton of oppression from a colonial system the baton of illiteracy the baton of early marriage and she's running with that baton she runs so fast she hands it over to my grandmother my grandmother holds that baton of poverty early marriage she runs so fast with that baton she hands it to my mother my mother grabs that baton she runs with that baton and she hands it over to me and i'm running with that baton ready to hand it over to my own girls when this woman this stranger comes to me and i feel like she said hold on you don't have to hand over this baton you can believe in your dreams so it's difficult to describe how moving the conversation was with today's guest Dr. Tara Trent she grew up in a small village in um what we now call Zimbabwe at a time where women and girls were completely excluded from education from participating in business and commerce and somehow found the will to what she calls no longer accept the baton of illiteracy and oppression and committed herself to a series of dreams that by all accounts so many people would have seen as impossible and there were moments critical moments along the way that allowed her to rise up to reclaim her ownership of education and to eventually bring her entire family to the United States for her to pursue a college degree a masters and eventually a PhD and then turn around and harness all of that for in her words the greater good and end up partnering actually with Oprah Winfrey to build schools that now have educated thousands back in Zimbabwe It's such a moving stunning uh, empowering story she's also the author of a really beautiful new book called the awakened women remembering and reigniting our sacred dreams so excited to share this conversation with you I'm Jonathan Fields and this is Good Life Project. It's so good to be spending some time with you this Thank morning. Thank you. I would love to take a step back in time with you. Yes. Um you grew up in from what I understand a small village in Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. tell me about life there. You know the the country used to be known as Rhodesia mm. uh because we were colonized by the by the British. and then uh later on uh now today it is Zimbabwe so i grew up in the northern parts of the country amongst the kore kore people so it's, uh, it's your rural village with your huts and uh no electricity no running water even up to now we we live with no electricity and running water the area was known for its uh tsetse fly uh the disease that uh, ravaged uh, livestock and it wasn't suitable for uh, human beings to live there but unfortunately because of the colonial system our ancestors ended up uh being pushed to live in those areas but growing up was very interesting for me because i grew up with my grandmother my mother and all these women and um after all the chores had been done in the evening i'd find myself with other many girls in the village sitting around an open fire and it was during the time of the war the war that liberated my country and when there is you know the moon is shining and uh the gun fires are far away who would find ourselves listening to these great stories around the fire and my grandmother and both my grandmother and my mother were such storytellers there were stories that has uh, remained with me even up to to this very day uh, despite the poverty and the war i grew up in a very rich cultural setting mm It's interesting as you just sort of recounted that to me. 
your eyes were closed for most of that, as if you were back there as you were sharing it. Yes, yes, yes. I um, it takes me back there because um, it's a place that I I love and I still do. Uh, but as I close my mind, I have to see my grandmother. I had. I have to see my mother because they are no longer here, mm. and uh, I get the I get that energy mm. from my ancestors, and I and I just appreciate uh, growing in that kind of wisdom. But it was it was also a tough time for for me and for many women because many women were illiterate, and even up to now, uh, many are still illiterate. But the desire for an education was always there. And I remember the very first time that I um, realized that I needed education so badly was when this freedom fighter who was amongst these fighters came to our community. And I remember the men standing up and holding this gun that they called the AK-47, whatever. And as he's holding that gun and he said, "Um, do you know why we are colonized and why the colonial system denies black people education? And I was very young and I could hear the elders going, "Mm, mm," and he said, To educate is to empower. To empower is to liberate. And to liberate is to enable individuals to have their dignity. And I could hear the the women ululating to that. And then I could also realize that as we were in the war, most of the men left the village. They had to go and work, and some they joined the freedom movement. And the women who remained, their only source of communication with their husbands was uh, the letters that would come to the village, to the women who could not read those letters. And uh, my aunt that I talk about in the book, my Aunt Chida, she would ask me, I was around six or seven years old, to accompany her to find a reader for her letters. So we would go up north and we find this young man by the river and he would read the letter. And my aunt, uh, somehow, she wanted someone else to read the letter. She didn't believe that. So we would go to a second person and they would read the letter. And my aunt would still say, well, I need a third person. You know, you know after I did my, my PhD, I thought, and I, you know, I did a lot of uh, statistics and I thought, well, you know, when they talk about a triangulation of your data, my aunt was validating the data. But what was um, painful for me was by the time we go back home to the community, every Jack and Jill knew the contents of those letters. It broke my heart. I cried to my mother and I said, Mother, I don't want anybody, I don't want anyone to read my my letters. Because I could listen to these intimate details between the two lovers being discussed openly. In my aunt, you could see her being demeaned every time. It It just broke my heart. You know, I come from a long line of generations of women, women who had been married very young before they could define their own dreams. I always talk about my great-grandmother. She became the fifth wife to my great-grandfather. And it was a polygamous relationship. She was very young. And my grandmother would go through the same process as my mother. And so by the time I was 18 myself, I was a mother of four. One of the children died as an infant uh, because I could not produce enough milk. And it took me a long time even to talk about uh, my dead child. I would always say I was a mother of three. It haunted me to talk about that child. I was a child myself. 
And then, soon after independence, a woman from America came to my community. Her name is Jo Luck, and uh, she worked for Hefa International. But during that time, I didn't even know she worked for Hefa International. And she found me with several other women sitting in a circle. And she asked one question, what are your dreams what are your hopes in life? I had no idea that as a black woman, I'm supposed to have dreams. I'm supposed to think about my life as something of value. And she kept on asking, and I opened my mouth and I said, um, I want to have an education. I want to have a BSc, which is an undergraduate. I want to have a master's. I want to have a PhD. And I had known about these degrees because as we gained independence, all of a sudden there were these foreigners who were coming to do research. And even the local university uh, from the capital city, they were now coming to do research. And I would hear the words BSc, Bachelor of Science, uh, Master's. PhD. And I could see these women, they had a kind of freedom as they talked about these things. And especially the Western women, they would always be wearing spectacles and they would always be pulling into their backpack papers and putting on those spectacles and read and remove those spectacles and look at each other. And I thought, I want those classes. I thought wearing spectacles was a sign of education. <laughs> so when I told Jola that I needed to have these degrees, she looked at me and she said, if you desire these dreams and you work hard, you can achieve your dreams. And she used the word tinogona in my language, which is it is achievable. And I, and I just looked at her Joe Luck had no idea that here I was expecting my fifth child and I had no high school diploma. How can she just say it is achievable? I felt inspired. I felt an awakening in me that another human being can just look right into my eyes and see something that I was not seeing, can see beyond my poverty beyond my oppression. And I ran to my mother and I said, Mother, I met someone who made me believe in my dreams. My mother said, Terirai, if you believe in what this stranger has said to you and you achieve your dreams, not only are you going to define who you are as a woman, but you are also defining every life that came out of your womb and generations to come. I had no idea what my mother was saying, but I realized in that moment that my mother was handing me an inheritance. She wanted me to break this cycle, this vicious cycle of poverty that runs so deep in my community, so deep in my family. And later on, I also realized that my great-grandmother, when she was born, she was born into this relay, holding this stick, which I call the baton. This is the baton of poverty, the baton of oppression from a colonial system, the baton of illiteracy, the baton of early marriage. And she's running with that baton. She runs so fast, she hands it over to my grandmother. My grandmother holds that baton of poverty, early marriage. She runs so fast with that baton, she hands it to my mother. My mother grabs that baton, she runs with that baton, and she hands it over to me. And I'm running with that baton, ready to hand it over to my own girls. 
when this woman, this stranger comes to me and I feel like she said, hold on. You don't have to hand over this baton. You can believe in your dreams. So when I told my mother, I think it was music to her own eyes. And my mother said to me, Terera, you have to write down those dreams and bury them the same way we bury the umbilical cord. I come from a culture where when a child is born, they snip the birth cord or the umbilical cord. They take the mother's old dress and they cut a small piece. They tie that umbilical cord into that piece of cloth and they bury the contents of the umbilical cord deep down into the soil, into the ground, with the belief that when this child grows, wherever they go, whatever happens in their life, the umbilical cord will always remind them of their birthplace. So my mother said, bury your dreams deep down into the ground, wherever you go, despite the abuse in your own life, the beatings that you receive from your husband, despite all that, those buried dreams will always remind you of their importance. So I wrote down, I want to go to America, one, I want to have an undergraduate, two. I want to have a master's, three. I want to have a PhD, four. And I was ready to go and bury my my dreams. I was happy. I, I wanted to see those dreams grow. And my mother said, I read back your dreams. When I, and when I did, she said something so profound that I think in many ways has shaped my life. She said, Tererai, your dreams will have greater meaning when they are tied to the betterment of your community. Holy moly. And I'm looking at my mother. What does that even mean? And she repeated the same thing. Your dreams will have greater meaning when they are tied to the betterment of your community. So I ended up writing my fifth dream. When I'm done with my education, I want to come back and improve the lives of women and girls in my community so they don't have to go through what I had gone through. And I buried my dreams. It took me eight years to achieve my O-levels, which is the equivalent of GED. I didn't have... A high school diploma. Be- because at that time, women generally had no yes, access to education. Yes. and because of the war right. and the oppression and all right. these things. During that eight-year window, what kept you saying, this must happen? The bearing of my dreams mm. and the wisdom that surrounded me and the realization that my mother allowed me to reflect on my past. In many ways, she was awakening me. And when I talk about the book, I talk about an awakened woman is one who knows the depth of her background, who knows the depth of her wounds, who knows the depth of her cry. And so I knew that I was I was hardly 21 and I was expecting my sixth child what was going to happen to these children and that realization alone it broke my heart but with the brokenness of my heart something in me started rising to realize that I needed to change my life I needed to hand over a different baton than the one that I was carrying on. So when I achieved my uh, high school diploma, 
I was accepted at uh, Oklahoma State University. But during that time also, I started working for some non-profits because the, the Zimbabwe, as we gained our independence, the donor community were coming in with the empowerment of messages, wanting women to be empowered, to be educated. So I, I got these small jobs, but they helped me. I remember my first job was cleaning the floors of, uh, the, there was this bus company, and I used to clean the floors. Uh, the bus, uh, the conductors and the bus drivers would pass through and have their breakfast and their dinner, and I would wash the dishes, and I would clean, and it's cleaning on your knees with a dirty rug and getting, you know, a little bit for the family. And then later on, as the NGOs were promoting more women, I started doing what they call savings clubs, gathering women together and saving the little pennies that we had so that we could access more resources from the government institutions. And I saved every bit of my money, afraid my husband would find it and I would always find someone to keep my money, my sisters, my sisters-in-law and everybody rallied around me. I was surrounded by women and I always talk about I stand on the shoulders of giants, I stand on the shoulders of other women. And so when I finally came to the uh, to the US, I did my undergraduate in um, uh, agriculture and then my master's in plant pathology, which is the same branch as agriculture. And um, I came with five children to the U.S. It was hard. I was an international student with no access to scholarship. I used to work three jobs in taking care of the children. And uh, my husband was able to come with the condition that that's the only way I can bring my children. Because that time, women, you could not just go to the passport office and apply for passports for your children. And to get a visa, you needed a passport. And he needed to endorse those papers. And he had refused. And um, I was already done with him. But I could not imagine leaving my children. Because I knew if I leave the children behind especially the girls, they were more likely to get married young. So I, uh, I sacrificed to bring him here. And unfortunately, he continued to be abusive. Uh, but thank goodness, the police caught him beating me, and he ended up being asked to go home. Mm. So I remained to finish my uh, master's. So uh, while you're here, though, you end up alone with five children. Yes. In a foreign country. Yes, yes. Going to school yes. and then trying to support your family at the same time. That must have been oh, incredibly difficult. It was difficult. But, you know, I would listen to stories of inspiration. I would think of the place that I had buried my dreams. And I would envision those dreams throbbing, mm -hmm. inviting me to say you need to achieve your your dreams. That kept me going because there was a time we ran out of food and uh, I went to the university and I said, this is too much. I can't go on. I can't see my own children. We live in a trailer house and um, we have nothing. And um, the university, there was this guy who was the vice president of the university, Dr. Ron Beer. He took me to a local store and begged the store to give me fruits. He said, you guys, at the end of the day, times you have fruits that are going bad and vegetables. Please, please give this woman so she can feed her children. I remember the manager saying, we can't do that in this country. If we give you these fruits and vegetables and if anything happens to you after consuming them, you might end up suing us. And I said, I have no time to sue anyone. So he said, okay, here is an arrangement that we can make. Four o'clock, make sure you come here. I'm not going to hand you the fruits and vegetables. We are going to put them in a cardboard box. We place that box near the trash can. Come pick your cardboard box and go home. Well, I used to take 16, 17, 18 hours of coursework 
taking care of five children. 90% of the time, I was late to that cardboard box and I would find the cardboard box in the trash can. I would retrieve the cardboard box from the trash can, wash the vegetables and fruits and feed my children and ask myself, who am I even to complain that my own children, they are eating from a trash can, food from a trash can, when I know there are thousands, if not millions, of children in Africa who are living on the streets, eating from dirty trash cans. Who am I? And who am I even to complain that I live in a trailer house? We have no electricity at times. Who am I? We don't have an air conditioner. Who am I when I know there are thousands and hundreds of women even here in America, who live on the streets and at times they live in shelter homes. Those thoughts grounded me. It helped me to realize in the grand scheme of things, I can see at the end of of the tunnel. I can see the light. What were the ages of your children around then? Ah, they were very young. I had uh, a nine-year-old seven-year-old, five, and um, almost 12 months old. And there was um, the oldest boy was almost 16. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like? Because for you, it's incredibly disruptive, but you know in your heart, you know your dream. Yeah. You know why. Yeah. And you've accepted, you say... I, this is the journey that I'm on. The, I'm, I am intentional in the decisions that I'm making, and I'm willing to accept this extraordinary change. I'm curious how your kids received this change, too. It was hard for the kids. I remember they were going to schools, yeah. and um, they wanted also nice things. We are yeah. in America. Right, because they're exposed to a completely yes, exposed different to, world yes, and culture. Yes, they wanted all that. Right. And I remember my 16-year-old at that time, uh, his name is Tsunga. He was named by my mother, which means perseverance, mm. as though to prepare him to say, you have to persevere. And I remember my son crying and saying, Mother, this is just too much for us. Look at the kids, Mom. We can go back home. It's okay. We can go back home. And I would look back at my son and my daughter and I would say, please, can you say we can do this? I want you to carry this dream with me, please. And I would beg and my kids and we are all crying and my son was very sensitive and he would say, okay, Mom, we can do this. We can do this. And um, you know what? The struggles were there, but there was hope for us. We were in a different country, a country of opportunities. We could compare ourselves with the people that we had left home, and we knew we were in a better place. And I had to ingrain my children, and I had to tell them the stories of the generations of women before me. They had to be grounded in that there's something beautiful when we tell our own children our vulnerability without burdening them and also by giving them a glimpse of hope i wanted them to hold on to that hope and i would always tell my my children that here is how i am defining myself I am a dreamer. I am the mistress of my own destiny. I am refusing to let the past define who I am. I defied the rules and norms of my culture. I refuse to keep silent about societal expectations that marginalize women at the expense of their dignity. And I refuse to keep silent. But you know, you would also ask, but why would I defy all those things? I had great hunger, hunger for a meaningful life in my life. 
And I always talk about there are two kinds of hungers in our lives. There is the little hunger. The little hunger is always looking how many clicks did I get on Facebook. The little hunger is is seeking for immediate gratification. The little hunger is seeking for fame and celebrity. But the great hunger, the greatest of all hungers, is I was taught by my mother and my grandmother, is hunger for a meaningful life. Ultimately, as human beings, we become bitter, and especially women, when we lead a life without meaning. And I wanted education. I wanted to hand over a different baton to my children. So when I graduated with my master's and I realized I could not go on with my PhD, I needed to take a break, I needed to work. And so I got my first job with Hefa International. My first trip was to go home and I went to the place that I had buried my dreams and I dug those dreams up and I checked going to America undergraduate masters and I folded that paper and reburied my dreams because I could see I still needed to achieve the PhD and the fifth dream that I call the sacred dream because when my mother said it wasn't about my personal goals, it was about how those personal goals are connected to the greater good. I came back, enrolled myself at Western Michigan University and achieved my PhD almost 20 years from the day I had buried my dreams. I found myself walking onto that podium to receive that paper that now says, Tererai, you are a PhD holder. In many ways, I felt like a lawyer who had closed her case. I felt this energy rising in me. If we give education opportunities to those who are torn down and marginalized, by the social ills of our time, they can achieve their dreams. If we give education opportunities to women and girls, I think it is the best investment any country could do, any society could do. And now I have my PhD. You would think I'm happy. No, I kept on thinking about that fifth dream. And I kept on saying, dear mother, why did you make me write that Fifth dream, why can't I just enjoy this life? Well, then I thought of an idea. When Jola came to the village, she used the word Tinogona, which means it is achievable. So I said, I'm going to design my T-shirts. I'm going to have Tinogona on my T-shirts and it is achievable on the same T-shirts. And I'm going to sell many T-shirts. Get enough money. Go back home like a giant, like an awakened woman, and show everybody in the village <laughs> that women can make a difference. I wanted to build schools. I wanted to have women empowered. Unfortunately, I only sold 20 T-shirts, and mostly to my American friends. <laughs> I was devastated. Then I got a phone call the most memorable phone call of my life, a call from Oprah Winfrey. And she donated $1.5 million. How was he even aware of you at that point? I'm, I'm curious. Ah, uh, Nicholas Christoph. With, uh, uh, the article New York. That yes, wrote, yes, right? yes, yes. So she wanted to meet me and, um, gosh, gosh, I could not believe it. And then I realized my mother and my grandmother Growing up, they were priming my subconscious for success. And I realized that if I had not taken that step to believe in that fifth dream 
And I call that fifth dream, the sacred dream, the dream of giving back to others. I don't think Oprah would have donated that 1.5 million. I don't think she would have even known about me. So today we have 11 schools going on with more than 6,000 children both girls and boys, going through those schools. We have a community library. The schools are in the rural areas where poverty is prevalent. But we are managing to educate boys and girls. For 60 years, the school that I attended when I was young, no child from that school had gone from grade one to high school and go to university. No. They would go from grade one, drop off grade seven, drop off or form two, grade eight. But today we have students that are in universities. We have one student, McDonald, he's doing a, a graduate program in business management at one of one of the most beautiful universities in my country, the University of Zimbabwe, despite the economic challenges that we are facing. But he is there. We have a student doing medicine at the University of Algeria. We have girls that are excelling. And if we get more funding, then we could have more. So I sat down and reflect about all these things. And I said... I am not taking credit to all these things because I stand on shoulders of many. And I also realized, gosh, I need to write a book, The Awakened Woman, Reigniting Our Dreams. And weave my own story with the stories of many other women that I had met in my life because there are so many women who at one time were forgotten, their dreams were forgotten, they were silenced, but they managed to rise. And so I'm saying, the rising of women is the awakening of everybody. The silencing of one woman is our silencing. We need to reignite the world to believe in the power of women. We cannot live in a society where women are marginalized. We cannot live in a society where we have even leadership, men leadership, who can say dirty things about women and we just watch it. We cannot do that. The healing of this world is in the hands of women. We need to recognize that. And it's a conversation about women, but not just among women. It's yes. a conversation that I think where we all have to be a part of that conversation. Yes. And, and it's not even really ab just about women. Yes. Because it's, it's about empowering women and girls, but at the same time, it is about the, using your language, the greater good. Exactly. Because we live in a society where most of the um, corporation jobs, the big jobs, are held by, by men. And yet, women are so smart, so gifted. It's a resource that we are losing. So when we educate women, we are also empowering men as well. We become a whole society. We are part of this planet. The Native Americans have taught us one thing. Humankind has not woven the web of life. We are one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we are doing it to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things are connected. Our very survival as men and as women is bound to the survival of other men and women and other societies. Hmm. One of the things I'm always curious about is uh, moments, 
single moments in time where everything changes. And I'm, I'm on an even more granular level. Yes. People in those moments. I've seen so many beautiful empowered stories of people where there was a single moment where yes. somebody who was meaningful in their life yes. said yes. Yeah. And everything changed. And, and when you, as you speak, I'm sure there were so many for you, oh. but, but you know, what j- sort of jumped out so clearly to me is the moment where you shared with your mother. Yeah. And instead of saying, no, no, Tedarai, like, that's not for you, she no. said, yes. Yes, yes. Like, and, and I always, I, I think in my mind, yes. moments like that, what if this one person yes. who had said no? Yes. You know, but just the understanding that this was the moment of yes. Yes, and that moment of yes can build a nation. My mother, when she said yes, she realized that baton that I was talking about. You know, all these women that I describe in my life, they had been married and exchanged for a cow. I was. And my mother would say, and you'd you'd read it in the book, we marry these young girls and young women, and we say we marry and we exchange them with a cow, and we say it's part of our culture. It will improve our culture. But in reality, when you reflect these women and girls that are exchanged for cows, they still remain in poverty. And the next generation comes in and exchanged for cows and married young without education and the cycle continues. We have to stop that. And so when she said yes to me, it was, we need to break the cycle. She saw the potential in me and gave me my own awakening platform. I always say when we sometimes say, this person empowered me. I always say, no, nobody empowered anyone. People create platforms of empowerment so that we step into those platforms to empower ourselves. And I think that that's what my mother did to me. And many women and men who looked straight into my eyes and saw something that I wasn't seeing and created that platform. Yes, it's a platform, a very big platform. Mm. We need more of that. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, I think so too. I really do. Yeah. Tell me, um, what does your life look like now? Wow. You know, it's 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 quite interesting. I at times I pinch myself, especially when I get. There was a time I got invited to speak at the United Nations to give a keynote, and I've done two of those. I had to go to the bathroom and just. Is this real? I speak all over the world. I get invited to speak. And I'm asking, is this real? But one thing that comes clear to me is the word opportunity. If we give others opportunity, recognizing the human potential without judging, we could have done more. We could do more for humankind because right now I feel even when I'm walking I feel dignity I do and I talk about women and men creating these circles of what I call sawira circles 
The Sawira relationship is fluid. It's women coming together and recognizing the strength of their collectiveness. Recognizing the yes platform that we can create for one another. If we can do that for each other, give back. And many have asked me, how do I tap into my great hunger? I always talk about, ask yourself, what breaks your heart? In that moment of brokenness, where you feel your heart breaking because of a circumstance, a situation, there are two things that happen in your life in those moments. It's either you feel overwhelmed and give up, or you feel a stirring in you. Look at the chaos that we are going through in America. I don't live in this country. I now live in Zimbabwe, and I came just three weeks and then to realize we have hurricanes going on, and now we have the shootings in Las Vegas. In those moments of our brokenness as a nation, people are coming together. There is an awakening in them. So what breaks your heart? That question alone should stir that awakening in you. It is in the times of our vulnerability that we gain, we see that great hunger in us. Adversity is a gift. I would not trade my life for any other. It strengthened me and made me realize that I'm not a victim. I'm part of the solution. Mm. I think tapping into... Hunger is a powerful part of, it becomes a motivating force. Oh, yeah. The other side is somehow finding the ability to believe mm-hmm. that mm. a different reality is possible. Exactly. And I think that's where so many of us stumble. Yeah. Because we don't, either we don't see it or if we see it, we just look at it and we say, how is that even possible? Mm, mm, mm. And, I, and I think in my case, I was very fortunate because I grew up with these wisdom women mm. surrounded by their wisdom mm. and um, practicing rituals, rituals that would ground who I am. I talk about rituals all the time. I write about rituals. I breathe rituals. They give me that groundedness to be rooted in who I am and to define who I want to be through those rituals. If they are working me. Many institutions, they have rituals. They have the pointers to their faith. Without faith, we perish. Without hope, we are nothing. We have to be hopeful. Yeah. Mm. When, you, when did you actually return to Zimbabwe to live? Oh, I've been in Zimbabwe now. Uh, it's now eight months. Yeah, I waited because I wanted to see my uh, my last born uh, graduating from high school and going to college. Mm. So she's now in college here in uh, California, and um, I have a daughter. She's um, she's in Oklahoma. She gradu she graduated with mechanical engineering degree, and I have another one. She did. Uh, she's at Western Michigan University, where she is doing uh, biomedical sciences. Um, so I wanted my kids to to win. I wanted to win my kids for me to be able to go back. Mm. And as soon as my last one graduated, I packed my bags and I said, "Home, where I left my umbilical cord," and that's where I am. Do you feel like they'll at some point return as well, or do you feel like they're more rooted in the United States now? You know, we all have choices. I tell my kids that we came to the United States for an education, 
for opportunities and experiences. It's up to you if you want to go back home. I am going back home. So I leave it to my kids. But I always hear some of them saying, I want to go home. Mom, I'm coming. The one who is doing biomedical sciences, she says, Mom, remember, I'm going to be your doctor. And I said, well, in my old age, maybe I can come to your <laughs> <laughs> to your hospital and maybe you could take care of me. I don't know. But I, 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 I see that. I see that. I'm not going to force them to say, you come home. You know, they have to make their own choices. Mm. But I would love my children to come back, especially my grandchildren, because I want to hand over that tin can that I had buried a long time ago to one of my (laughs) great-grandkids. Yes. How does it feel to you knowing that the baton that was passed from generation to generation to generation to you is no longer being passed on to any more generations in your family and in so many other families now that you have had that effect on? You know, it feels uh, great, but there are no guarantees that the baton will not retain. And that's the reason why I wrote this book, The Awakening of Women, reminding women that we need never to be complacent This is a journey for us. If we want to change the world, we better start by changing ourselves, defining our own narratives. So my my children, they know that. I tell them, I said, you might drop the ball, but I always want you to know I worked so hard, but I don't want you to feel guilty about it. Because we have to accept mistakes in life. We have to accept things that might happen. But this this seed that has been planted will always remain reminding you, reminding us that we are on a journey. We can't drop this ball. Hmm. So as we sit here in this beautiful conversation, container is this good life project, so... If I offer out the phrase to you, to live a good life, what comes up? If you ask me to live a good life, is that, can you ask in different ways? Yeah. um, When you think about what it means to, to live on the planet well. Yes, yes. What does that mean to you? What does that look like to you? It means to feel all, to have that dignity that's got life for me, to realize that I have the same rights as anyone else, to realize I have a space here on earth that's got life, and never to fear that someone is going to oppress me or oppress my neighbor and to realize that I can be a force for good. That's good life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If the stories and ideas in any way moved you, I would so appreciate if you would take just a few extra seconds for two quick things. One, if it's touched you in some way, if there's some idea or moment in the story or in the conversation that you really feel like you would share with somebody else, that it would make a difference in somebody else's life, take a moment and whatever app you're using, just share this episode with somebody who you think it'll make a difference for. Email it if that's the easiest thing, whatever is easiest for you. And then of course, if you're compelled, subscribe so that you can stay a part of this continuing experience. My greatest hope with this podcast is not just to produce moments um, and share stories and ideas that impact one person listening, but to let it create a conversation, to let it serve as a catalyst 
for the elevation of all of us together, collectively, because that's how we rise. When stories and ideas become conversations that lead to action, that's when real change happens. And I would love to invite you to participate on that level. Thank you so much, as always, for your intention, for your attention, for your heart. And um, I wish you only the best. I'm Jonathan Fields, signing off for Good Life Project.